the 1919 massacre of thousands of peaceful demonstrators in Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar by the British Army saw the unleashing of a fresh round of civil disobedience. This time, Gandhi came out with a call for Swadeshi, for a boycott of foreign clothes, for crippling the cloth mills of Manchester with the use of his jarka, the spinning wheel, which became his symbol for self-reliance. For Mahatma Gandhi, symbolism was important, especially those symbols which represented the aspirations and needs of the average Indian. On the 12th of March 1930, Mahatma Gandhi set out on foot from his ashram in Sabarmati with a band of followers. His destination, 385 kilometers away, the seaside town of Dandi. His resolve, to win freedom for his countrymen. Only 10 days ago, the British had imposed a tax on salt. Salt, which was a compulsory component in the diet of every Indian, including the poor. The salt march galvanized the nation. Thousands of people joined the march. The procession was greeted warmly in villages. Women in huge numbers came out in support. All over the country, demonstrations against the British took place. Once again, a major consolidation of nationalist feelings was evident. And this time, it percolated to the grassroots. Finally, on the 6th of April, 1930, Gandhi reached Dandi. He picked a fistful of salt and took on the might of the empire. It was a symbol of the refusal by Indians to live under British law. A novel method of protest which gave Gandhian philosophy a moral dimension that was almost transcendental which gradually made India's freedom struggle an inspiration for the world over. Among all those struggling against colonialism, non-violent demonstration was the thrust of Gandhi's form of protest. He said that I am born in India, so I am fighting for Indian independence. If I was born somewhere else, I would be fighting for something else. But my basic objective is to help liberate humankind from oppression and injustice. But the British replied with ruthless repression and firing on unarmed crowds of men and women. Over 90,000 protesters, including Gandhi and other Congress leaders, were imprisoned. The Congress was declared illegal. The years that followed saw numerous rounds of talks between the British and various sections of Indian polity. By 1935, through a Government of India Act, the British planned to involve a section of the country into elected provincial assemblies. Only 14% of the population was allowed to vote, and the divide and rule policy was once again evident as an overriding strategy. The elections to the legislative assemblies, organized on the basis of restricted franchise and separate electorates, inevitably produced separatist sentiments. The Muslim League, led by a Bombay-based barrister, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, propagated the theory that Hindus and Muslims were two nations and could therefore never live together. Gandhi and Congress opposed this idea vehemently. To them, secularism had been the linchpin of the freedom movement, and India's secularism had its roots in its civilization. Secularism, you're using it as a word, as a concept, it's obviously a modern concept, but this society has basically rested on this kind of a consensus, on mutual adjustment, on mutual accommodation. So secularism was an idea that was, as it were, imposed from the above, but again, it was done so because people were sensitive to the fact that this, this society rests, operates on an inter-community network. 
Between 1937 and 1939, Congress leaders repeatedly met Jinnah to conciliate him. But Jinnah remained adamant. In 1940, the Muslim League passed a resolution demanding the partition of the country and creation of a state called Pakistan. By 1939, events in faraway countries had begun to find their resonance in India. The Second World War had broken out, and the Indian National Congress leaders were in full sympathy with the victims of the fascist forces. But an enslaved nation could not be drawn into the war. They demanded that India must first be declared free. On the 8th of August 1942, in a historic Congress session, Gandhi told the delegates, do or die, and told the British, quit India. Once again, the British struck back ruthlessly. The entire Congress leadership, including Gandhi, was arrested, and they were to remain imprisoned for the next three years. But the fight was now carried forward in the streets and in the hearts of the average Indian. The freedom struggle had by now created a dominant feeling of oneness, a unity in its diversity. And the entire country, even with its seven major religions and what would eventually become 18 official languages, was looking to the end of colonial rule with a sense of urgency. The story of India's freedom was also of heroes and heroines, many of whom, through their personal sacrifices, were to achieve greatness. If Nehru, Patel and Azad were disciples of Gandhi, there were others who were equally convinced that the British could only be defeated through an armed struggle. 15th of January, 1941. A person in the garb of a Muslim priest gets into a car from a house in Elgin Road in Calcutta and drives towards Bihar. In Bihar, this gentleman gets into the Kalka mail train headed for Delhi. Ten days later, a Pathan named Ziauddin is sighted traveling in a truck from Peshawar to Kabul. A few days later, an impeccably dressed Italian, Orlando Mezzotta, travels from Kabul to Berlin via Moscow. Three faces of one man, a man called Subhash Chandra Bose. By now, some of those fighting for freedom had opened up a front in Singapore. The band of fighters was called the Indian National Army. On the 5th of July 1943, Subhash Chandra Bose took over as the supreme commander of the INA. And in a historic call, he told his supporters, give me your blood and I will give you freedom. His slogan was Dilli Chalo, onwards to Delhi. This slogan kept reverberating till 1945, when the Second World War came to an end. By June 1947, through the India Independence Bill, the Labour government in England had agreed to relinquish power on the basis of dominion status to both India and Pakistan. The horrors of communal carnage and the bloodbath which may have ensued forced the Indian nationalist leaders to reluctantly accept the partition of India. But till the very end, Gandhi argued against this division of the subcontinent.